As I give us this invitation, I just ask you to join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we are invited to your altar with the challenge of our influence, the authenticity of that influence, and how we do that on a daily basis, Lord. And that's quite a challenge. It's not always easy to be the flavor and the light of Christ. It requires energy, righteousness, uh, grace, discipline, and holiness. And so, Lord, as we are challenged to think about how we're doing that, uh, don't let the evil one, Lord, in Jesus' name, uh, guilt us, but let your grace show all the areas that we are doing in the areas that we can shine in with our gifts. Open our hearts up, Holy Spirit, to hear you in your invite. And open us up, Lord, to become more flavoring more of an influence for you. We ask this, Holy Spirit, and may the words of my mouth, may they not be my words, but the influence of your words, Holy Spirit, with gratitude and expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. My voice is a little hoarse this morning because I went up to Breezy Point to do some wakeboarding, skiing, had a great time, showed off. I told them all I was your pastor. And they, I don't think they like that, but we showed off, had a great time. But I left the window open one night in influenza. That was a joke. <laughs> Good grief. Come on, you guys. Okay, I'm going to say it again, all right? I know some of you are like, whatever. Okay, I left the window open in influenza. <laughs> Thank you. Good grief. Holy cow, talk about influence. Okay, all right. So we're going to look at a little more lessons from Jesus as we are invited forward. And, and he gives that whole kind of beatitude thing. Those are tough things. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who have the gift of mercy. This is tough stuff. And then he kind of wraps it up. And he asks you and I to be the salt or the flavor in the light of the world as we're invited forward. And really, really as he looks at salt right away, it's really about influence. Uh, what is it that drives us, that influences us to be holy because Christ is holy? In other words, where's our motivation coming from? And to illustrate that in kind of a fun way, there was a gentleman that worked at the cheese plant in town and he decided because he lived so close that he didn't need to drive during the warm months. And so during the warmer months, he would walk home and it was a shortcut to go through the local graveyard. And so he worked the relief shift, you know, that shift from about 2 in the afternoon until 11 or midnight at night. And he would walk home and sure enough, uh, fate would have it as he was walking through the graveyard and the late night of the night, 11.30 midnight, he fell into a freshly dug grave. It was September, early October, and it was very hard to climb out at that time of night because that ground, that dirt, was very moist from the cold air at night. Well, he, it was a small enough town, so he decided to, to settle in and thought, you know, no one's going to bother me. And he pulled his overcoat up and, and kind of fell asleep in the corner of that grave. About 2 o'clock in the morning, as you would know, the town drunk fell in the same grave. Yeah. And the town drunk was trying to get out, and he finally woke up the gentleman behind him, and the gentleman just politely but quietly said, you'll never get out that way, and he did. <laughs> See, that town drunk, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, unexpected, he had some major influence to get him out of that grave. And you and I are looking at Jesus, and he's, he's challenging us, and he's, he's trying to tell us we're the salt of the earth. Salt was used by the Roman system, the Roman Empire, to preserve stuff. They did not have refrigeration. And so salt was a very high commodity. If you put it in the meat, you preserve it. You put it in the, in the food goods, you preserve it. It helped keep its flavor. And you and I are, are, are challenged to look at the purity and the authenticity. Now, purity is an interesting word because the flavor to help us be pure is not me. I'm not pure. I'm impure. 
I, I think things I shouldn't. I act in ways I should not. And I sin. But Jesus becomes the salt, the flavor of the grace of my purity. I come up here and I realize grace is real. And that salt flavors me. And I get a second 1,000, 1 billion chance in life. And I become pure again. And because I'm so overjoyed with that purity and that salt, I take it out into the world. And I remind myself, along with others, grace abides. And all of a sudden, we become authenticity of the salt of Christ. We get that challenge to, to soak up that grace, soak up that salt, and then we are the influence of that salt as we leave. But the challenge is, do we believe that? Do we truly believe that? And that's a challenge only you and, you and God can answer, or I and God can answer. You see, once salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing. In the Roman Empire, when the salt lost its flavor, it just cast it away because you can't reuse it. So the challenge as we come forward is to see how we feel about the grace is it more than just a religious habit? Is it the salt, the, the influence, the preserving of our lives? And that, by the way, that grace, that salt that Christ offers, it's eternal. It's eternal. In the end, Christ wins, and no one can rob us from that. And all of a sudden, we, we are reminded that, that it becomes very real when we hear Christ say, as he's saying to the people in the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying to you and I, you're the salt of the earth. But the salt has lost its taste. If we don't believe in the grace. We don't have the faith to believe in it. How can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything. But it's thrown out and trampled. Underfoot. And then Jesus moves on. And he says, you're the light of the world. And he reminds us that we are also not just that grace, that flavor, that salt. We're the light of the world. And we're challenged to be that light of the world. We're challenged to be out there not hiding the light, not ashamed of the light. That doesn't mean we grab people and we tell them if they died or they know where we're going. That never works. Please don't do that. I'll get mad if you do. But, but we are the light of the world. When they come into the classroom, the children, and we're teachers, we're the light that they see during the day. I remember my mentor, my pastor, when I would come in and I had something very, I think, minute wrong, but when you're... 21 and your car doesn't work, you think it's a big deal because you don't have enough money to pay the bill. And my pastor, I'd say, oh, he goes, what's wrong, Bob? And, oh, my car's not working well. Oh, cheer up. You could have been born in Bangladesh. <laughs> I'll always remember that. I'm like, wow. He's got a major point. I've been to border towns in Mexico. I've been in situations I'm like, you know, I'm really blessed. I'm really blessed. And all of a sudden, being the light of Christ becomes very real to us. And it's really that challenge. Are we open to being the light of Christ? I was coming back from Redbird Mission with a bunch of youth. They had a great time. That's a United Methodist Mission in the Appalachia, Kentucky region. And we were driving back on the way through Chicago. We were going to go to this mega church called Willow Creek, a wonderful place. And we got lost in South Barrington. And we were driving, trying to find the church. And we came across the United Methodist Church on this road. Barrington Road. And it was Sunday morning. We pulled in and this pastor met us. And we got out of our van. We obviously looked like we were from uh, Litchfield, Minnesota. Because the van said that, pulling a big trailer. And, and the pastor met us and he said, You were lost, but now you're found. And he had such a smile on his face that we didn't even want to go to Willow Creek. I'm not making this up. He just said, how are y'all doing? And he, he shook our hands and said, you're lost, but now you're found. And we got to the point where we didn't even want to go. That pastor had such flavor. It wasn't as big as Willow Creek. It wasn't some mega church. But we wanted to be at his church because of the way he greeted us with the light of Christ. As opposed to that, I was pulling my boat out on Vans Beach one day during water ski camp in July. We'd pull our boat out every night and they'd check for water milfoil and diseases and all that. 
and there was this college kid that was checking that week. Don't worry, he doesn't go to this church. He's not even from this town because what I'm going to say is not going to be good. And we pulled up and he was sleeping in his car. And he was supposed to be checking the boats and everything. And he was sleeping. I mean, this guy was out like a light. He was sleeping. He was, I was talking and he wasn't waking up. That dude was asleep. All right? <laughs> and my friend and I were cleaning our boats and we thought, you know, we can't let this go. We got to do something. I mean, he was out. And we thought, what can we do to him? Put a, maybe a bottle rocket in the table. We didn't do that, don't worry. <laughs> we cleaned the boat up. That guy's sleeping. We're thinking about our tax dollars. We went over there and we woke him up good. You should have seen his eyes when we found it on the car. Whoa! He wasn't into what he was supposed to do. He was not flavoring what he was supposed to do that day. But you and I were challenged to flavor. It's football season. Next week, we've had the preseason. That's great. It's been somewhat good. I'm glad the Vikings actually lost a game. That gives me hope for the season. <laughs> and if we're Viking fans, that's what we're like. We, we, we purple, we're the ones that bleed purple. We're kind of, we're, we're careful to smile, aren't we? We, we don't want to smile too much because we know that we've been let down before in the last few years. Recently, we've been a little bit of a drought. Those of us that are purple are holding out. We're praying. And then there's those stupid Packer fans. <laughs> they run around and they strut like they're, you know, you guys, you, if you're a Packer fan, you run around and you go, oh, we're going to win everything. Because we always do. Because we have Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> you know, you guys, you got flavor. I'll give you that. But you wait. You wait. Someday, us purple people eaters, we're going to be strutting around with some flavor also. Our day's coming, we're due. And we've seen you in droughts, too. I remember when Brett Farr came over to us, you weren't strutting so well that season. But, you know, that's the flavor that Christ is looking for. We don't, we're not some NFL earthly football team. NFL stands for not for long. We have an eternal God. And this grace... It's everywhere we breathe. When I do things I shouldn't, I swallow grace. I learn from it, don't get me wrong. And you and I, on this quick lesson from Jesus, we're challenged to be more than some earthly football team. We're challenged to go into this week, and in the midst of everything we gotta face, in the midst of the cancer, the surgery, the marriage problems, the coworker problem, the employment problems, the problems at church. We have flavor. And we have the light of Christ. And when we put our head on the pillow at night, we go to bed because we are saved by grace. And we get to live forever. And so you and I are challenged as we come forward to find that flavor and find that light. Do we want to be an influence? The Methodist bishop was asked, who was the greatest influence on his life. And he said confidently, without missing a beat, he said, that's actually very simple. It was a, a volunteer youth director. This Methodist bishop grew up in a small, small town in southern Illinois, Bishop Woody White. And he said, it, it was other people, but I always remember the two volunteer youth directors when I was a kid. They worked all week, and they were there for us in our youth group all the time because they flavored Christ, they loved Christ. And they didn't do it because they got a paycheck. They didn't do it for other reasons, they just loved us. The old Bishop Woody White, who's in heaven now, said that was the influence in my early years. And so you and I, we are challenged. In the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen. We get now the joy of coming up and, and, and soaking that, that salt up, soaking that light up. And so as I invite us to the Holy Sacrament of Communion, and it'll be on the screen in just a bit, I want to remind us that Communion is open to every single one of us. The joy of the United Methodist Church is we don't hold barriers for anything. 
we, we encourage everyone. This table is open to every one of us, and we are all worthy of it. I just ask that as you come forward, and we're honored to serve you, that you come and I come with a desire to follow Jesus Christ. If you would come by way of the side aisles, we're going to have some communion servants and myself are going to be honored to serve you at each aisle. And then after you are served the elements, if you would like and you're physically able, just take some time and kneel and pray to the Lord. If you need to stand, stand. And if you need to be served for physical reasons, then few will be honored to do that. But come up, soak up the altar, use the music as a blessing. And so as I invite us forward... First, I want to do that with a prayer of confession. That prayer will be on the screen, and I just ask you and I to soak up that prayer, followed by a silent time of invitation, followed by a pastoral prayer of forgiveness. As we pray this prayer, let these words come alive. Don't just read it, but let the Holy Spirit speak to us together as we pray out loud. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Silently, let us listen to God's invite. Gracious Lord, we hear your invite. We understand intellectually your grace is greater than what we all ever need. Help us faithfully believe it. Holy Spirit, give us the power to come forward believing that we are forgiven. We are forgiven, men and women and children of God.